I now call to order the Society's 2,441st meeting in the 150th year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to PSW Sciences Spring 2021 meeting and lecture series. Because of COVID-19, the Society is bringing this meeting to you via Zoom from locations all around the globe. Rather than our usual home, the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC. Our speaker tonight is William Powell, director of the American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project. He will be speaking to us about how biotechnology can be applied to conservation and bring back the American chestnut tree that once dominated Northeastern forests and graced many of our by byways, parks, and homes. I'm Larry Milstein, President and Program Director of PSW Science, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, founded in 1871 as the Philosophical Society of Washington to provide a forum to exchange scientific ideas, further scientific understanding, and encourage scientific inquiry. This lecture is being recorded and will be posted to the PSW Science YouTube channel where it will join over 160 other recordings of PSW Science lectures. We invite you to explore these presentations. And if you like what you find to become a member and to subscribe to the PSW channels on YouTube and Vimeo, as well as to PSW on Twitter and Facebook. The Society is grateful for the sponsorship of the 2021 lecture series by the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and by a donor who asked to remain anonymous. And we are grateful to the sponsor of this evening's meeting, PSW member, Tim Thomas, Please join me in thanking our PSW sponsors. Thank you one and all. Before we turn to the lecture, in keeping with the society's traditions, we will welcome new members and read the minutes of the previous meeting and the summary of the previous meeting's lecture. I am pleased to announce that the following members have been elected to the society. Jonathan Williams, Program Director for Astronomical Sciences at the National Science Foundation, interested in astrophysics, several areas of applied physics, geophysics and meteorology, among others, who learned a PSW from colleagues. And Bill Powell, our speaker tonight, who learned a PSW through our invitation to speak and whose interests will be clear in some small part from tonight's lecture. Please join me in welcoming them to membership. Welcome. PSW is a membership organization and a participatory membership is central to PSW's mission of communicating and furthering science. I encourage everyone with an interest in science to become a member. It's easy to do using the PSW website. Go to the homepage, www.pswscience.org. Click on the blue join button at the upper right corner and follow the prompts. We will welcome you to membership. PSW Science is a 501c3 charitable education and professional organization. Dues payments and other donations are tax deductible. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2440th meeting and the lecture by Tony Tyson on satellite constellation interference with astronomical observations and what can be done about it. James, the screen is yours. Thank you, Larry. Good evening, everyone. On May 7th, 2021, by Zoom webinar broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, 
President Larry Milstein called the 2,440th meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. He welcomed new members, and the recording secretary read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Tony Tyson, Distinguished Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California, Davis. His lecture was titled, Satellite Constellations and Astronomy, Satellite Interference with Astronomical Observations and Potential Remedies. Since 2017, the number of low Earth orbit satellites has increased exponentially every year. These bright objects have begun to impact observations from Earth-based telescopes. The Rubin Observatory, formerly the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, will carry out an astronomical survey dubbed the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, or LSST. The telescope will have an 8.4 meter primary mirror, a 3200 megapixel camera, and will take 2000 images of the sky every night for 10 years beginning in 2024. Each exposure will last approximately 15 seconds and each night, automated software will identify changes in the sky, for example, movement or changes in brightness. Tyson described the LSST as a wide, fast, deep survey of the sky, which may be significantly impacted by satellite brightness trails. He showed an illustration of the observatory's camera and he described its hardware. In tests, the brightness of satellite streaks approached the saturation level of the camera's charge coupled devices and small capacitive crosstalk among the output video amplifiers created echo streaks. Tyson's lab is working on how to dim the satellite streaks and eliminate the crosstalk. It is not possible to merely dodge satellites to keep them out of the LSST exposures. Tyson said the fast cadence of the survey will not allow the LSST to focus only on clear areas of the satellite cluttered sky. Currently, SpaceX is working to reduce the light pollution effects of its Starlink satellites on optical astronomy. Tyson said making spacecraft 10 times darker may remove some satellite trail artifacts. But even then, evidence of satellite trails will still be in the LSST data and complicate its analysis. SpaceX recently launched a test Starlink satellite called DarkSat, on which the usually white colored microwave phased arrays were colored black. But while the test succeeded in reducing the satellite's light pollution, the dark color caused DarkSat's transmitter and phase arrays to overheat. SpaceX then launched a second test called DarkSat, which used a sunshade to block sunlight from the satellite's antennae and prevent reflection. VisorSat is four times fainter than the original Starlink satellites. Different satellite parts reflect light at different angles, appearing to flux as the satellite travels across the sky. These changes in brightness may set off false alerts in the LSST's data analysis. Tyson said SpaceX is now experimenting with modified satellite positioning as another mitigation measure. Satellite altitude also impacts light pollution. Satellites orbiting 500 kilometers above the Earth are visible only at sunset and sunrise, whereas 1200 kilometer satellites are visible all night long and take longer to decay. The Satellite Constellations 1, or SATCON 1 workshop, developed recommendations to mitigate satellite harm to optical astronomy, including fewer satellites, darkening satellites in all phases of orbit, orbiting as low as possible, providing high accuracy orbit data, and advanced algorithms for avoidance of bright satellites. However, Tyson said no combination of mitigation efforts can completely avoid the impacts of the satellite trails on the LSST science programs. Tyson closed by explaining how satellites also pollute observations in radio astronomy. He then answered questions from the online viewing audience. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. President Milstein then adjourned the meeting at 9.38 p.m. Temperature in Washington, D.C., 13 degrees Celsius. The weather, raining. A number of concurrent viewers on the Zoom and YouTube live stream, 83. And views on the PSW Science YouTube and Vimeo channels, 204. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. The minutes will be posted to the website in due course. Please send any corrections or comments on the minutes to corresponding secretary, Robin Taylor, at corresponding 
sec at pswscience.org. A video of the lecture is available for everyone without charge on the PSW Science YouTube channel, the PSW Science Vimeo channel, and it can be accessed directly from the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. We now turn to tonight's lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Bill Powell. Bill is professor of environmental science and forestry at the State University of New York College of Environmental Sciences and Forestry, where he is director of the American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project and serves as scientist in residence at the Roosevelt Wildlife Station. Bill's research focuses on the American chestnut tree and the chestnut blight pathogen that has driven it almost to extinction. He has studied the hypervigilance, hypervirulence mechanisms of the fungus and has used classical and molecular genetic techniques to develop blight tolerant chestnut trees. Among other honors and awards, Bill was named Forest Biotechnology of the Year by the Institute of Forest Biotechnology. He received the Exemplary Researcher Award bestowed by SUNY ESF and the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Research and Scholarship. Bill earned a BS in biology at Salisbury State University and a PhD in biology at Utah State. All questions will be fielded in the Q&A session after the lecture. Bill, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, welcome. I'd like to uh, start my talk with a question. When is the last time you hiked through a chestnut forest? It's kind of a rhetorical question, of course, because we have no more chestnut forests. And that's kind of a shame. At one time, if you were look at this scene in the back of this slide, about one out of every four trees would have been American chestnut. So what I'm gonna be presenting today is um, our work on the American chestnut and how it can be applied to conservation. Uh, this is part of a larger uh, collaboration. It's called the Three Bird Collaboration with the American Chestnut Foundation. Three Bird stands for Breeding, Biotechnology, and Biocontrol, United for Restoration. Uh, I'm mainly focusing on the biotechnology. So what I'm going to do is tell you the story of the American chestnut, why it was important, what happened to the American chestnut, what did people try to do to save the American chestnut and what we are doing to try to bring this uh, important tree back. So why is the American chestnut important? Well, as I said before, it's one of the more common trees in the Eastern forest. Um, this is one of the rare pictures of the actual chestnut forest in uh, Shenandoah National Park in 1912. And we know all those trees are chestnuts because if you look at the top of the trees, you'll notice that whitish tinge. What you're actually seeing there is the catkins, the male flowers of the chestnut. Sometimes people describe this as almost like being snow in June on top of the trees because of this whitish color. So it was a very abundant tree. You notice from the picture that it was also um, a very common tree and it was the tree that filled up the canopy of the forest. Now the American chestnut had many values. It had a wood products value. The wood was straight grained, rot resistant, uh, used for many purposes. I remember my uh, grandfather who sold antiques used to tell me, you get an old piece of furniture, you often didn't find the chestnut on the outside, but you found it is in the inside, like the insides of drawers and stuff because it was so easy to work. It was kind of a common wood, but very, very important. It was also agriculturally important. The nuts, you could eat them raw, you can eat them roasted. You can grind them into a flour and bake with them. Um, you can even brew them into a gluten-free beer, which is important to me, if a person who has celiac, um, can't eat gluten. Um, so you can make a lot of gluten-free products with it. Now, both the uh, Native Americans as well as the early settlers uh, used chestnut as medicines. They used the leaves, they used the bark, used to make teas out of them. And there's actually some research going on more recently with uh, European chestnut, which is very similar to American chestnut, where they found there's actually compounds in the leaves of the chestnut that will inhibit the um, uh, growth of staph infections. So have some medical uses. 
And of course, it's a part of our culture and a part of our history. Um, you can't go to a town uh, in the United States without seeing a Chestnut Street, just like you'd see a Maple Street or an Oak Street or a Walnut Street. Um, it's kind of been enshrined in even our songs around the holiday season, you will notice um, this song uh, called the Christmas song it starts off chestnuts roasting on an open fire. They're really talking about the American chestnut in that song. In the fall, people used to go out with their kids and go chestnutting. Just like here in New York, we always go out apple picking, but people used to go out chestnutting. And the trees were some of the largest trees in the Eastern forests. Uh, some people used to call them the redwoods of the East, but of course they never got as big as a redwood because those are monster trees. Um, but they were numbered among the tallest trees in the East. And this is a classic picture of some timber type American chestnut trees with lumberjacks standing around them. But they weren't only these timber type trees, they were actually a diverse species. Sometimes they would have this spreading form and you can almost vision that uh, poem uh, by Longfellow, Under the Spreading Chestnut Tree, uh, even though that was not an American chestnut, that was uh, describing a horse chestnut, but you can almost picture an American chestnut being in this situation also. Our first uh, dean at the uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry uh, was a forester, and he wrote a lot about trees. And one of the things that he said about the American chestnut is this quote, it is claimed that in certain districts, the farmers realize more income from the sale of chestnuts than all other farm products. It's a pretty Im important statement. Now it's not everywhere, but in some districts. And the neat thing about this is that these were not orchards. They these were not planted trees. These were wild trees. So the people, you know, it's almost like having manna from heaven, you know, a free crop uh, on your land. All you had to do is go out and pick it up. And of course, that's what they did. They collected the uh, chestnuts, often bring them into the local stores and they would sell them and ship them off to the cities. And in the cities, you'd see uh, chestnut vendors on the street, especially around the fall and the holiday seasons, uh, selling roasted chestnuts. I particularly like the picture on your left, uh, the vendor selling hot chestnuts, good for the brain, try a bag. So at our college, we're an environmental college. So one of the things that we are most interested in is the chestnut's uh, impact on the environment. Uh, chestnut was a keystone species or a foundational species, and it fed everything from bees to bears. Uh, bees uh, collecting the pollen or bears and blue jays and, and um, squirrels and turkeys eating the nuts. Even the leaves were important, the leaves that would fall and enter the streams, the uh, larvae of insects would feed off those and then fish would feed off those larvae. So a very, very important uh, species. When the chestnut was lost, there was actually um, several insect species that went extinct because of the loss of the chestnut. And this is what happened. Uh, we had an exotic um, pathogen introduced in this country and this invasive pathogen went through the forest killing the trees as it went through. And some places where you had 100% uh, stands of American chestnut, you'd see these ghost forests. So what happened? Well, a little over 100 years ago, people started importing Asian species of chestnut. And they did it for a number of reasons, for um, ornamental trees, as well as agricultural trees. And those are good trees, but they didn't realize at that time, when you bring a tree over, uh, from halfway around the world, you're not just bringing that tree, you're bringing all the microbes that are also on that tree. So they brought this one uh, microbe over uh, called Cryponectria parasitica, a uh, fungus. And it was of course quite happy to come here as you can see from that plate. Uh, and what it would do is um, it normally is a, a, a saprophyte on the uh, Asian chestnut species, but when it jumped off onto the American chestnut, American chestnut was very naive to this fungus and it did not have all the defenses it needed to stop it. So this fungus would enter a wound such as that little branch scar there. Um, it would colonize that wound. It would start producing acids and enzymes and form this structure called a canker that you see in orange. Um, that canker right around here would um, spread, eventually girdling the tree and basically choking it off, killing everything above the canker. If the canker reaches the base of the tree, the whole tree would die down to the ground. And of course, when this first went through, people were panicking. Can you imagine the 
uh, one of the most common trees, the largest trees in the forest, just dying in a wave as, it, as the blight went through. And these are the kind of headlines you would see. Uh, this is one of the rare pictures of um, a chestnut forest along the Long Island Railroad in New York. And uh, this is not during winter time. This is actually during the summer. And you see the tallest trees there in the forest are all dead. Um, this is what people saw mile after mile after mile along that railroad. Uh, as the blight took out those trees. So the blight was actually introduced in the late 1800s as people imported the Asian species, but it wasn't actually described until 1904 uh, in the uh, Bronx Zoological Park. So that's kind of the official date of the start of the blight. And within about 50 years, spread through the whole range of the American chestnut shown on that map, killing somewhere around 4 billion trees, and again, some of the largest trees in the forest. Now, chestnut uh, blight not only affects chestnuts, but also related species, such as the Allegheny chinkapin and the Ozark chinkapin. It was actually very serious on the Ozark chinkapin, and they thought it almost went extinct. Uh, luckily, there's still a few survivors and people are doing breeding programs with it. Now, it not only affects related species of uh, chestnuts, but also can survive on oaks. And that's important because even after the blight went through, if we had lost all the chestnut trees in the Eastern United States and you had some separated and segregated uh, from the blight, you can never bring them back because the blight doesn't go away. It's still smoldering in our forests on the uh, oaks. So the only way to bring back the American chestnut is to make a tree that can coexist with the blight. Now it's kind of interesting historically, and as the blight went through, um, people were uh, starting to plant a lot of agricultural chestnut trees, a lot of hybrids. And one of them was a very popular one, it was called the Paragon Chestnut. And they planted some very large orchards. This is an example of a 300 acre orchard in Pennsylvania. And the people who were planting these, they just didn't seem to be very concerned about the blight. And they wrote things like this, much of the agitation over the chestnut blight was greatly exaggerated, little more than a scare introduced by certain sensational newspapers and magazines. Uh, kind of sounds like what you hear today about global warming or climate change. Um, so back then people just didn't want to accept it so they didn't believe it. Now that uh, 300 acre orchard is not there anymore. It was wiped out by the chestnut blight. So with this devastating disease going through, why aren't the American chestnuts extinct? Well, they're not extinct because they're surviving at the roots. There's literally millions of stumps that are surviving still in the forest. And that's a good thing because that allows us enough genetic diversity to bring these trees back and have a viable population. So the way these stumps are surviving is that the blight fungus cannot compete with the soil microorganisms and therefore the roots and the root collar of the tree is protected. The tree also has the ability to sprout from this root collar, but it's kind of stuck in this, uh, and it can actually sprout quite vigorously. Uh, this is an example of a coppice tree uh, in our research plots that grew seven feet in a single season. But it's stuck in this Sisyphus-like cycle, and you know Sisyphus from Greek mythology, he was doomed to roll a rock up a hill only to lose control and have to start over and over again. That's basically what the chestnut tree is doing right now. This is how it's surviving. It gets killed down to the ground. It sprouts, grows for a number of years. It could actually grow and to old enough age to actually produce flowers, but it eventually gets the blight again, gets killed down to the ground, sprouts, and goes through these cycles over and over again. Eventually though, the roots run out of energy and the whole tree dies. Now people say, well, if it can grow old enough to actually flower, why don't, don't you have um, some kind of selection going on and, and having a few trees overcome the blight? Well, it's not, that's not really happening because the chestnut, even though it has both male and female flowers, they're self incompatible, okay? So you have to actually have two chestnut trees to get viable nuts. And they have to be within a fairly close distance, about a thousand feet, actually better at about a hundred feet, but at least a th within a thousand feet to get any uh, viable nuts. 
And so there's very rarely a tree that can get to the stage of actually making flowers. Um, this is a flyover in Maine and looking for flowering chestnut trees. And you can see one in there. If you look real hard, there it is right there. Um, do you see any other flowering trees nearby? No, there is none others. So even though that has been lucky enough to make it to a flowering stage, it's a very large tree. Um, it is not producing any viable nuts uh, because there's nothing there to pollinate it. So this was so devastating. There was a lot of efforts to try to fight the blight. There was commissions uh, established. There's uh, some in Pennsylvania that were very large and they threw a lot of money at it. They, these are some of the things they did. They tried to control it with fungicides. Uh, those did not work. And of course you can't put fungicides on a whole forest but even on individual trees, they really did not work. They tried sanitary methods by removing infected trees um, wherever they found them and then you know, healthy trees that surrounded them. Uh, that did not stop the blight, mainly because the blight fungus also survives on the oaks. So you can cut down all the chestnut trees you want and the blight's gonna travel across on the oaks. They even tried some pretty radical stuff like trying to replace the American chestnut with non-native uh, timber type Chinese chestnuts. So they went out to China, tried to find the most timber type ones, bring them back and actually put them in the forest. And there was like tens of thousands of these planted uh, in our forests by the USDA uh, Forest Service. Um, very few of those are surviving today. They are not adapted to our forests. They even tried uh, a popular process that started back in the 1950s and um, became really popular in the 1970s, and that is mutagenesis. So they took um, literally thousands of chestnuts and treated them with gamma or x-rays to try to uh, produce a uh, advantageous mutation that might confer resistance. Uh, and then they plant those trees, they cross those trees uh, through a couple generations. Um, still, none of these proved to be blight resistant. Where I got my start with chestnut is actually working uh, on a system called hypervirulence. Hypervirulence is, a, uh, is where you have a virus that actually infects the fungus and reduces its ability to form a natural canker or a killing canker. Um, and this was actually looked at as a very promising uh, method uh, uh, back in the 1970s and 80s and 90s even, um, but the problem with the biocontrol and the hypervirulence is that it really did not spread from tree to tree very well. So it was very good at curing an individual canker, but not for control of the blight. So there was species uh, hybrid breeding, trying to bring genes in from the Asian species to the susceptible species, which were the American chestnut, as well as the European chestnut. And then there was back cross breeding of these hybrids, which is still going on right now. And then there was adding resistance genes through genetic engineering, and we'll eventually go into um, future editing and RNAi. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, few slides is mainly focus on these last three steps that are still uh, going on today. Okay, so you can actually buy. Uh, chestnut trees, and, um, but most of these will be either Asian species or hybrids. Hybrids are very popular. And, you know, when you listen to my talk, you might think I don't really like hybrids, but actually I think hybrids are great, um, but they have certain purposes. They're okay as ornamental trees or they're okay as uh, crops, but they're really not for restoration, okay? And that's what I'm going to show you why next. Remember that the four chestnut uh, species, a tree type uh, chestnut species, evolved in different parts of the world. And they are well adapted to those parts of the world, but they're not adapted if you move them from one side of the globe to the other. And therefore, if you start crossing these, you're gonna get a mix of genes that some help you be adapted to your local uh, environment and some do not. So hybrids um, actually started being made before the 1920s, uh, mainly to improve the crops, uh, chestnut crops, but after the 1920s to actually improve uh, blight resistance. Um, so if you, you know, one of the more popular ones that are out on the market right now is called the Dunstan chestnut. And it's a nice chestnut. It has 
uh, very large nuts that it produces. So uh, if you like um, a, a good crop, that's a good tree. But if you look at those nuts there and you compare it to a wild type American chestnut, they're quite different. And so which one would be better for wildlife? Well, it depends on what wildlife you're thinking about. Obviously these mallard ducks, they would not be able to choke down those large chestnuts. The smaller one actually would benefit them more. And therefore the smaller the nuts, the better it is for wildlife. Also, it turns out the two canopy species of chestnut, the American chestnut, Castenia dentata, and Castenia sentiva, the European chestnut, um, are the two that are susceptible to chestnut blight. The resistant ones, such as Castenia melissima, uh, Chinese chestnut, and Castenia crenata, the Japanese or Korean chestnut, um, are resistant. So if you were to cross these, what you end up with is something that's intermediate. And that won't survive in our forest because our forests are very competitive and you have to reach the canopy. Chestnut will not flower unless it's in full sun. And to get in the full sun, it has to hit the canopy. Now, hybridization has a lot of documented risks and a lot of them you can see actually with all the work that's been done over the past hundred years with chestnut. Oftentimes you get things like reduced growth, you get intermediate traits between the two species, um, the uh, desired traits are often lost as you go through future generations. One of the really common things is male sterility. Uh, when you make crosses, uh, actually that's a, a good thing as far as in agriculture because it helps you to control what's crossing with your trees, but not for uh, a restoration. There's some strange things that happen, like there's a, uh, a phenotype called cracked bark when you cross certain uh, species of chestnut. There's also another one called internal kernel breakdown, where about 40% of the nuts basically disintegrate inside the shells. Obviously things not needed inside for a tree that's going into a restoration program. Um, but most of these things that I just mentioned are manageable or it can be uh, uh, prevented or bred out if you're in an agricultural setting, okay? So again, hybrids are great for agriculture, but not necessarily for restoration. So there are better ways to make a restoration tree. And one of those ways was started by the American Chestnut Foundation back in 1983, where they actually began with a hybrid up there at the top left. And the idea here was you're gonna take that hybrid and back cross it to the pure American chestnuts through several generations, select for resistance, but also select for the more American genotype or phenotype, I should say. And so what you're basically doing is you're trying to carry through the resistance genes from the Asian species and at the same time, remove unwanted traits. And this is a, a typical breeding uh, uh, program that people would do in agriculture. Now, this looked like a really good plan because, and eventually you get a, a tree that's mostly American, 15 16th American. So this was a good goal. And when they first started the program, they thought there was only two resistance genes in the Asian species, and they quickly found out there was at least three. Um, and so the idea, well, even with three, you're gonna be mostly American. But more recent studies of this back cross breeding program that's been going on for a long time now, is that it's not just three genes. There's actually genes on all 12 of the chromosomes of chestnut, and that really complicates breeding. In fact, right now, uh, after um, how many years has it been now? It's over 30 years, 35 years or so. Um, the best they have gotten so far is intermediate resistance and still retaining 70% of the American genome. And there seems to be this direct co correlation between the blight resistance and the percent of the Chinese uh, genome from these crosses. So it's a very difficult program. It's still going on and still making progress. They have got intermediate levels of resistance, but they are having some challenges and they have to get a tree that's enough American-like that it will survive in our forests. So this is where I like to introduce you to genetic engineering and why genetic engineering is actually really useful for restoration and for conservation. So I'm gonna compare this hybrid breeding um, and the back cross breeding versus genetic engineering. And I, and I use this example for the general public 
Uh, and this is one of their favorite slides because it really makes them understand what's going on. Now remember that chestnut uh, has a lot of traits that allow it to be adapted to the Eastern forest, the American chestnut. And one of those is like the uh, timber type canopy growth. So you kind of keep that in mind as I go through this slide. Now chestnut has about 30,000 pairs of genes, okay? So you get 30,000 from your mother, 30,000 from your father. We know that because the genome has been sequenced. So hybrids um, would mean that you have about half the genes are going to be the Chinese chestnut alleles. And even in the back cross, the best they've done so far, around 30% would still have the Chinese chestnut alleles. Now, the way I like people to visualize this is using the book example, and you might have seen this before. So imagine that the genome of the chestnut is like a book and the genes in the genome of chestnut is like the words in a book, okay? So these books describe the chestnut tree, okay? So even the back cross program where you still have 30% Chinese chestnut gene alleles, you're still gonna have around 9,000 words describing the Chinese chestnut. Now, most of that doesn't matter because a lot of the trees have very similar characteristics, but there's many that are important for adapting to our forests. For example, you wanna have genes that say, make me more resistant, right? But what you don't want is the genes that say, make me shorter, make larger nuts, or anything else that's not adapted to our, our ecosystems, okay? So that's hard to do, to keep the genes you want and not the genes you don't want when you have that much of the Chinese genome left. Okay, let's look at the same example now. Only we're gonna look at it from the point of view of genetic engineering. Again, we still have the book. And this time we're gonna start with a book that's 100% describing the American chestnut. And I wanna pull out a um, theoretical passage from that book. Um, I like this passage, it says, it was very exciting at that season to roam the then boundless chestnut woods of Lincoln, it was written by Henry Thoreau, and he was a chestnut enthusiast. So what we do with genetic engineering is basically make a very small change. We're only adding to this book. We're adding one, two, or three words. So now you have this book that completely describes the American chestnut. You get to this passage, and it says it was very exciting at that season to roam the then boundless like tolerant chestnut woods of Lincoln, okay? Nothing has changed in this book except for the addition of the blight tolerance, okay? So another thing that you need to know um, when you think about this is that genetic engineering is also gentler to the genome. And a lot of people don't realize this. When you do hybridization, there's a lot of mismatches between the different chromosomes from the different species. And because there's uh, uneven crossing over, you have mutations, you have deletions, you have inversions, you have a lot of things happening uh, during the breeding. Uh, and, and it shows up in the offspring. And that's why you have a lot of those unexpected uh, results such as male sterility and such. But here with the genetic engineering, we're keeping the 100% genome and just adding blight tolerance making hardly any change to the genome at all. And we can actually check those changes because we can sequence the whole genome. Okay, so genetic engineering, it's actually a better way for conservation. So which genes should you add? Well, the way we have approached it, I mean, there's different ways. You could do it uh, through um, looking at the genetics of the trees and trying to find genes that are in the resistant and, and not in the susceptible tree. But we like to take a mechanic, mechanistic approach. How does the fungus actually attack the tree? And can we counter that attack? This is a really nice model uh, developed by Fred Hebert a uh, long time ago, and it kind of shows the different stages of the blight infection and how they differ and how they are the same in susceptible and resistant chestnut trees. And we're gonna go down this uh, left side first. Um, what happens is that chestnut blight uh, fungus will enter through a wound. It needs a wound actually to colonize the tree. And it will for form a hyphae in that wound and basically live off dead material. 
So it's living off uh, like a saprophyte. Both the American and the Chinese chestnut will respond to this by throwing down a lignified zone to try to wall off that fungus. Then um, after that, uh, a wound paradigm forms, which will eventually uh, form vascular tissue and start to heal up that wound as a tree grows. If that's a small enough uh, wound or small enough canker there, it will actually slough it off. It might be deep and go all the way down to the uh, heartwood um, and therefore you have a little scar there, but basically the tree survives. So in resistance, resistant trees, this fully forms uh, and the tree survives, but in susceptible trees, something else happens. The fungus changes in a way that it starts forming mycelial fans. Ahead of those fans, it starts dropping acids, the main one being oxalic acid, and along with that, enzymes that uh, work well in that acidic environment, and it breaks through that lignified bar barrier. The tree keeps trying to respond, but the fungus can outpace that response and forms the canker. Okay, so how can you counter this? So what genes do we use? Well, all the way back in 1978, people were looking at and describing how the fungus attacks a tree. Back in 1978, I was still in the Air Force before I even went to college. So this is old, old information, but very valuable information. And in this paper, they describe oxalic acid as being a major virulence factor, as well as an enzyme called poly galacturonase. So the oxalic acid, which I'm going to talk a lot about in just a few minutes, um, basically it's a toxic uh, acid. It lowers the pH to around 2.8, which is uh, deadly to the plant cells. It can actually inhibit lignin formation, right, that lignified barrier, and it might even it may even trigger a hypersensitive response. Hypersensitive responses are normal responses if you want to defend yourself against a biotroph pathogen but it really, they don't work well against necrotroph pathogens because necrotrophs live off dead material and a hypersensory response you know, relies on dying and, and therefore biotrophs can't usually break through those, but uh, necrotrophs can. But plants have uh, been exposed to this type of acid um, throughout evolutionary history. So there are enzymes in the plant world um, that can defend a plant against this. And they're called oxalate oxidase. And there's actually a few other ones too. And basically this removes the toxin. Now remember the polygalacturonase, this uh, plants have also learned to respond to this. And um, this particular enzyme, what it does, it degrades pectin in the cell wall. And uh, plants have evolved inhibitors of this enzyme. And I wanna talk about that in just a minute. Um, another gene that we are very interested in, not mentioned in this paper, but it's a gene that encodes a lacase-like gene. Uh, lacase-like genes, or lacases anyway, help to uh, shore up the lignified zone in the plant. Um, and I'll be talking about that more in just a minute. So the trees that we're going through that you're gonna be seeing First in the field are, are gonna be the, ox, the ones with the oxalate oxidase, but I wanna mention these other two because lots of times people think we're putting all our eggs in one basket with the oxalate oxidase. Well, really not. We are looking at other genes to go along with it. So these polygalacturonases and their inhibitors are very interesting in that um, what a fungus will do when it attacks a tree, it will release these into the environment as well as with the oxalic acid. And these things are very active at that low pH. But a plant will normally respond with these inhibitor uh, proteins that you see um, on this diagram here. Let's see. Now, the trick with um, adding these inhibitors to in boost resistance is that these work by a lock and key type of mechanism. They, they are very specific. Um, so, you know, the fungus can make a lot of different PGs and the plant make a lot of PGIPs, uh, but you have to get the right ones to um, basically uh, counteract this attack. You also have to get the right amount um, because this is kind of a one-on-one -on -one defense. So you want to produce more of the inhibitors than the fungus can make uh, um, of the enzyme. So we're kind of in the early stages of this and we're just beginning to clone and 
and test these PGIPs from chestnut as well as red oak. And we're looking at red oak because uh, again, the fungus can survive on red oak, but it can defend itself quite well from the fungus. So we're thinking, well, maybe it has some good PGIPs. So we have to try to identify the ones that will actually inhibit the fungus. So the other gene that we like um, is a lacase-like gene. L recently, lacases have been shown to be able to increase resistance in uh, certain plants, such as this example, the cotton uh, lacase. Um, and by way it does it in this case is by increasing lignification, that walling off of the fungus. So lacases actually produce um, flavonoids and support lignin formation, both are defense responses. So we've actually looked at the lac cases in both American and Chinese chestnut. And it turns out they're really kind of interesting in that their amino acid sequence is 100% identical. And their nucleotide sequence is 99% identical. So you might think, well, they both have exactly the same thing. You know, how can this be a resistance gene? Well, not by any differences in their amino acid sequence, but by differences in how much they make of this enzyme. And we've looked at expression of um, the lacases in both American, uh, in blue is labeled AC, both in uh, non-inoculated and inoculated uh, stems. And if you look at that in the American, you do get some induction of this lacase uh, in the presence of infection. But in the Chinese chestnut, it's just expressed a lot all the time, at least tenfold higher. So, you know, we think that this might be one of the genes that help increase resistance in the Chinese chestnut. Now, remember that the genes in Chinese chestnut, there's not gonna be any single one gene that makes a tree totally resistant. So we're looking at this as a possible gene that will enhance resistance along with our oxalate oxidase, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. So how do they express differently? Well, they have different types of promoters or they have slightly different types of promoters. Um, we amplify a section of the promoter, the genetic switch that turns on these genes and, and controls how much is being made. If we look at the Chinese chestnut on your left, it's very, very consistent. Uh, the promoters are very consistent in sequence. If you look on the right, actually there's quite a few, uh, or there's uh, variability in this promoter. And if you actually look at the sequence, and it's kind of hard to see in this, but this is the promoter sequence. And if you look at the green letters, those are the um, sections of DNA that are present in the Chinese chestnut, but absent in the American chestnut. So we think, you know, this might have some enhancer regions, things that help turn up the expression of the lacase in Chinese chestnut. And therefore, you know, we could possibly use this to enhance expression in American chestnut. In fact, because these sequences are fairly small, we're starting to think about uh, using CRISPR, and this might be a good target for CRISPR editing. We are also just uh, putting the genes in uh, with stack vectors with the oxide oxidase, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. Uh, we're putting it in using vascular promoters for both the lacase and the oxide oxidase as well as constitutive promoters, and those are in the pipeline right now. Okay, so let me turn to the one that's the one that's gonna go through the regulatory process first and be the first one we use for restoration. And that is the gene that encodes an enzyme called oxalate oxidase. And the one that we are using comes from wheat. We only chose that one because it was the most studied, but oxalate oxidases are ubiquitous in plants and fungi. And since this comes from wheat, I have to say this, it's a non-gluten enzyme. Again, I have celiac, I would never put a gluten enzyme in a plant that I might wanna eat. Um, it's also a non-allergen. So this is found in a lot of different crop plants. Uh, this is just a, a, a partial list uh, with references. Uh, so you might see something that you already ate today. So you're eating this um, particular enzyme all the time. It's also found in many different wild species, so it's not gonna be new to nature. And it's even can be found in fungi and bacteria listed down below. Now, something that's really interesting is that we've been testing chestnut trees, both Chinese chestnut and American chestnut 
for oxalate oxidase activity, and we have not found it, but we've only been testing stems and leaves. Um, when we actually looked at the genomes though, there is a uh, set of genes in the Chinese chestnut that looks a lot like an oxalate oxidase. Uh, they match pretty well but we haven't seen that activity. So are those really oxid oxidases? There was one paper uh, where there was a um, hybrid that um, in the buds, they said they detected oxide oxidase activity, okay? So these might be real oxide oxidases and they just might be expressed in certain tissues and not in the, in the, like the stems to confer resistance to blight. So we might just have to try to see if we can get these expressed in the correct tissues and, and control the blight. So how does this enzyme work? Well, basically it detoxifies oxalic acid. It takes um, the acid, combines it with oxygen, forms hydrogen peroxide and carbon dioxide, two things the plant uses all the time. Hydrogen peroxide helps to form lignin, lignin. Carbon dioxide, of course, helps to form sugars. And the nice thing about this particular enzyme from wheat is that it has what's called a signal sequence on its uh, amino acid sequence that allows it to be targeted outside the cell. So it actually goes to the extracellular region um, where the fungus is gonna be attacking and where the acids are gonna be uh, present. So not in the cell, but out of the cell. So this is not a pesticide and we made the, all our arguments we could with the EPA saying that, well, maybe you don't regulate us because we're not a pesticide, but they still said, well, if you do any kind of mitigation, you are a pesticide. Uh, so unfortunately, they still regulate us. Um, this does not kill the fungus, has no cytoactivity whatsoever. And this is kind of important because when the fungus survives, or since the fungus survives, less of lack of pressure is put on this particular gene or, or on the fungus to overcome this particular oxide oxidase, okay? We're not relying just on that. As I mentioned before, we are looking at other genes to stack with this. Uh, such as the PE, PGIPs and lactases, cases and actually some others. But this particular gene seems to be the most effective at um, inhibiting canker growth. Okay, so how do we get a gene in? Well, uh, we use agrobacterium transformation or agrobacterium mediated transformation. Uh, agrobacterium is a natural genetic engineer. It's found in the soil. It will engineer plants so that the plant will make food that only that bacteria can consume. Uh, so it's a really nice system the way it evolved. Um, but other things that are interesting about it is that it has actually been engineering plants that we are eating uh, for a long time. There was an article out uh, several years ago uh, showing that agrobacterium is responsible for all our sweet potatoes. It was engineered by agrobacterium in the wild uh, either 6,000 and 8,000 years ago, actually uh, two times. There's been more research recently, and you know, we're in the age of genomics where uh, plant and animal and bacteria genomes are being sequenced right and left. Um, there's a recent study uh, back in 2019 where they look for traces of agrobacterium transformation in wild plants. And they looked at um, several hundred uh, dicot plants and found that 7% of them had either some uh, remnant of a agrobacterium transformation and some of them even had active genes from the agrobacterium. So as we engineer the American chestnut and we wanna put it back out in the forest, it won't be the first GMO, so to speak, in the forest. Um, there's already plenty of them out there just formed naturally. And those include things like walnut. And there's been more papers coming out looking at lateral gene transfer. So this whole idea of moving genes from one species to another, again, isn't unnatural. It's something that happens in nature. And basically this is what scientists do. They kind of mimic what goes on in nature. And we can do this to save species. Okay, so how do you get this gene into the tree? The agrobacterium, um, it basically puts the gene in one cell at a time. And so what you have to do is regenerate a whole plant from a single cell. And that's what this series of slides kind of show you is how to make a tree from seed the hard way, uh, basically using tissue culture. Um, we first have to isolate immature embryos. We tried to do 
leaf tissues like people do with poplar and other tissues. Uh, this doesn't work. You really have to use embryo tissues for chestnut. There's about a two week window where you can harvest fertilized chestnuts, the immature ones, and they're at just the right stage to start these embryo cultures. Um, they're aseptically isolated. You see on the uh, right, uh, a cluster of embryos. Um, not all of them will be fertilized. Usually as the nut grows, only one of them becomes dominant and takes over. Um, but we transfer all of them onto media. And it's not very efficient, but about one out of a thousand of these embryos will start and form what's called a somatic embryo culture. But the nice thing is once you have these cultures going, they can be maintained for a long time. This is a picture of a embryo cluster and um, we can maintain them for actually a number of years. Eventually they do try, they kind of um, peter out over time, but we can maintain them for several years and use them over and over again, or those cultures over again. So this is what we start with the agrobacterium media transformation. Uh, when we first started this process, it took us 24 months to go through from transformation to a potted plant now we've uh, optimized it and we're down to less than 12 months for the transformation process. And what we get when we transform a chestnut is what was called an event. And you know, many of you probably know what an event is, uh, but it's not a concert. Um, but I'm gonna just make sure everybody knows. Uh, you know, events are when you transform a cell and then regenerate many trees from that cell. So this is an example of an embryo cluster transformed with a marker gene called green fluorescent protein. This is what we use when we first start developing these trees. Um, this is not in the trees that we are going through the regulatory process. So if you look at that uh, little spot there, that would be one event, okay? And we can regenerate a whole tree from that. We can regenerate a whole forest from that. But over here, this is a different cell that has been transformed. And that's a different event. And we can, again, regenerate a whole tree from that and a whole forest from that. Okay. So why do we need test uh, so many events? Well, when the gene gets inserted or the gene construct gets inserted into the genome, it goes in uh, semi-randomly. So if you're looking at the 12 chromosome pairs of chestnut, um, what would happen is with one event, you might end up in this particular spot in a chromosome. But in another event, it might go over here into that chromosome. Sometimes you get multiple inserts, okay? So this is going in in kind of a semi-random fashion and going into different places, okay? And depending where it goes, affects the expression of that gene. It's called position effect. So I kind of uh, like to describe this as you know, um, like real estate, location, location, location. Um, here in Syracuse, if you were to have a, a house and let's say it was valued at $150,000, if you took that same house and cloned it over in San Francisco, it would be worth a lot more. It just depends on where it's located. Same thing happens with genes. Depending on where it's located, you're gonna get different levels of gene expression. And this is just an example of uh, different events going down the line there. Uh, this happens to be uh, events of a uh, lactase gene that we put in. Um, and you can see on your left, you have the normal expression in American chestnut. Then you have the expression in the Chinese chestnut and the, or two different Chinese chestnuts showing a variability of lactase expression. And then all those ones that say Travis are actually American chestnuts with the clone gene. Uh, with the um, 35S promoter driving the gene. And what you see here is the higher the bar, the higher the amount of enzyme being made, okay? Now, some people don't like this, you know, because you say, oh, you're getting all these events, you know, what are you gonna do with them all? Well, the nice thing is it gives you selection. It allows you to pick the events you wanna work with and discard all the others. So we might wanna pick this one, the one that matches the highest expression of this particular Chinese chestnut, and we can do that. We also look at events for where the gene goes in, and we've actually you know, sequenced the whole genome of Darling 58, as well as its uh, LS1, which it was made from, 
And we know um, if there's a single insertion or multiple insertions, for example, the one we're going through the regulatory process has a single insert on chromosome seven, also known as chromosome G. We know exactly where it's located. We know that it is not inserted within another gene, which could happen. Um, so we, if that happened, we can actually get rid of those events. We had one that we got rid of. And we also know what's the closest gene to the insertion site. And um, so no endogenous gene interruption. We look at the expression of the closest gene and it does not affect the expression of that closest gene. And so far, therefore, this is really not having any effect outside of the genes that we put in. Okay, so once you do that, how do you get a whole plant? Well, you have to go through different stages of tissue culture. You take your embryos, you go through different uh, medias to take it through, almost mimics what goes on inside of a seed as it's germinating. And Dr. Maynard, who was my colleague for uh, many, many years, uh, developed these techniques. Uh, he said each one of these steps was like a master student project. And you eventually end up with um, shoots. You can get whole forests in a jar. Um, these shoots, of course, are not ready to go out in the field. They have no cuticle on the leaves, no roots on the bottom. So you have to um, root them. And we do that actually very similar to the uh, way people root flower, uh, things like African violet leaves. You dip them into a, a hormone and then you put them into soil and you get roots. We put them into a uh, growth chamber to slowly decrease humidity or start off a high humidity, slowly decrease it into the cuticle forms. And uh, we also start increasing the light. We get them into the greenhouse and then we finally get them into the field. This is Dr. Maynard, my colleague for a long time. Um, and our first trees planted out in the field were in 2006. Uh, this is also uh, Herb Darling helping them plant the tree. Herb Darling is the person who we named the first transgenic trees after the Darling trees. Okay, so how do we test for resistance? Well, um, we have a really quick preliminary test called a leaf assay test. Um, and we can tell the difference very easily with this for certain traits of resistance. And for example, uh, in this particular one, the non-transgenic forms a large necrotic area where the um, resistant one forms a very small. And of course we repeat this over and over again and, and do stats on it um, to make sure that we are uh, seeing a, a significant difference. Okay, so this is the, uh, some of those leaf assays done with uh, the lacase gene. And because the leaf assays um, are kind of like unique experiments in and of self, each one we do, we uh, normalize them to the American chestnut. That's that blue line in the center here. That's the amount of necrosis in the American chestnut. And then the orange slashes here are the Chinese chestnut controls, looking at how much necrosis is in there. Uh, we kind of use chinkapin as control because chinkapin has intermediate levels of resistance. And sure enough, it shows intermediate here with leaf assay. Uh, these are a couple of our oxalate oxidase uh, American chestnuts that have very high levels of resistance, more in this case than the Chinese in the leaf assay. And there's the, leak, uh, the uh, different events from the uh, lacase gene. And you can see some of them do enhance resistance. Uh, other ones do not, and this is most likely due to different levels of gene expression. Okay, so that leaf assay is a good assay, but it doesn't test everything. If you look back at um, what's going on in a stem, leaf assays probably are testing detoxifying enzymes, such as the OXO. Uh, it can also test uh, inhibitors of enzymes, such as the PGIPs, and it can also probably test uh, antimicrobials like flavonoids. Um, those probably are all very good, um, or the, the leaf acid is good at testing those types of things. But it was probably not good at looking at this lignified zone, okay, that happens in a stem, because a leaf is not a stem. <laughs> and uh, so therefore, we have to do other tests um, to get the full picture of what's going on. And that's where our small stem assays come in. Small stem assay, basically we take stems uh, all the way down to uh, three millimeters uh, and up. And we uh, inoculate them by making a small wound on them, uh, put the fungus on that wound, wrap it up, let it sit for a few weeks, and uh, then look at what happens. And 
On your left is the wild type American chestnut. It's all wilted, you can see, because it's susceptible. On the right is the Chinese chestnut control, which is resistant. But even if sometimes if you get two small stems, they can wilt. In the middle are some of our American chestnuts uh, that are expressing the oxalate oxidase gene, and they are surviving. So we had some resistance and we wanted to start outcrossing these to uh, wild type trees to build up diversity because when you make a tree through genetic engineering, you start with a clone and we don't want to put a clone out into the forest. Um, so we want to start doing outcrossing, but if we were just doing normal type of outcrossing, uh, that would take us several years. I mean, you might get the first catkin in three years out in the field, but usually it's five to seven years. Um, so it takes a long time to do breeding in the field. So what we did was we did some uh, testing and we found out we can actually induce flowering under high light conditions in a growth chamber in less than 11 months. And this greatly spread up, sped up our breeding. So we can now take our transgenic trees or our genetically engineered trees and put them in the high light growth chamber, um, get catkins forming, collect the pollen from that, and then go out to wild type American chestnut trees that we are maintaining in the field, which we're always fighting the blight on, um, but we can get them big enough that we can do crosses and actually get offspring. And half the offspring will inherit this uh, oxalate oxidase gene. We know that the uh, resistance is, is inherited. This is an example of some T1s uh, from those crosses. In the green there is the area of uh, necrosis on the stem. You can see it's very low on the uh, genetically engineered ones. The blue is the wild type and C, uh, the CC, the red is the Chinese chestnut. So we can inherit this resistance from generation to generation. Now, I just wanna point this out. This are some small stem assays on larger stems out in the field. These are about one centimeter stems. And you see that again, the Blight can cause damage even on Chinese chestnut, the resistant Chinese chestnut on the left. Um, but it's quite different than the susceptible American chestnut on the right. And the one that uh, gives you the, uh, or expresses the oxi oxidase um, is more like the Chinese chestnut than it is to the one that doesn't have the oxalate oxidase on the right. Doesn't mean there's not gonna be no damage, um, but this means that it can survive, okay? And that brings me to an experiment we're just starting to do. Um, and um, to understand the experiment, I need to talk about a little bit about resistance, uh, resistance model. And we're, when we talk about this resistance, we're talking about mainly the host's contribution to resistance, not the pathogen and the environments. So if we look at Chinese chestnut, a lot of times people think, well, Chinese chestnut's resistant, boom, period. Well, it's not. Chinese chestnuts actually have a range of resistance and you can actually see the range by seeing how much damage the fungus will do to the tree. So less damage, higher resistance, more damage, lower resistance. Same thing with American chestnut, only American chestnuts are susceptible. And, but there's a different degrees of susceptibility, okay? So we kind of can see that by how fast the trees die. So the quicker death, the more susceptible, the slower the death, um, the less susceptible. So what we've done is we've taken one type of tree, LS1, and we've added oxide oxidase and we bumped it up to the resistance side of this model, okay? So this is not working by itself. The oxide oxidase is contributing to normal resistance in the tree. It has other resistance um, genes. And so it bumps it up at a certain level. So if our, our hypothesis is, if we started with a more susceptible tree than LS1, we would still get this bump we probably get a less resistant tree uh, on the other end. Same thing if we start out with a more resistant American chestnut or, or, resistant, or less susceptible American chestnut, we would get a bigger bump into a more resistant offspring. Okay, so we're actually testing this. We have uh, taken uh, our trees out to the third generation. So we're getting some diversity there. We're planting what's called a common garden. We just planted uh, our first one yesterday. Uh, 500 trees that's going to be duplicated in three states. And we're going to see if the genotypes of the trees affect their amount of resistance. 
we're also doing crosses to some of the back cross trees to stack resistance. So remember the back cross trees have gotten up to some intermediate levels of resistance, uh, even though they're still 30% uh, Chinese, um, when, you out, when you cross it to one of our transgenic trees, it actually gets to be less of those Chinese uh, genes. And we're looking at, will this actually bump up even further um, because we're combining these, these different resistance genes? And we're gonna be finding that out soon. So we can do this breeding because we know that um, uh, the, the link, the genes for resistance in the Asian species and the oxalate oxidase are not linked. We've actually sequenced both the Darling 58 and the LS1. We know that the um, Darling 58 is on chromosome seven or also called chromosome G. We know exactly where it's located. Uh, and we also know approximately where the QTL resistance on the uh, chromosomes are. And the one QTL that's on chromosome seven is actually toward the middle of the bottom part of the chromosome. So quite distance, distant from the oxide oxidase. So those should sh uh, shuffle independently or segregate independently as well as the other genes. And um, you know, all the genes on the other chromosomes should segregate independently. And therefore we should be able to mix these in with the oxide oxidase. For example, the lactase like gene, even though we're, we're transforming it in, uh, or uh, genetically engineering it in, um, we could also breed it in because it, this particular gene on the Chinese chestnut is on chromosome one. Okay, so this independent assortment allow us to not only do transformations to stack genes, but we could also do it through breeding. Okay, so we have these resistant trees. What do we do next? Well, we can't give them out to the public. We can't start restoration because these are highly regulated. And so we have to work through the uh, federal regulatory uh, coordinated framework, which works with the EPA, USDA, and FDA. So before we started, we started doing many uh, typical comparative studies, uh, plus some additional ones that are kind of unique to our trees. Uh, things like uh, we looked at mycorrhizae colonization or the roots since we're uh, doing kind of a antifungal type of defense here, we wanna make sure the good fungi that uh, colonize the roots are not affected. And we found that they were not. We even did some bee uh, feeding studies, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Uh, looked at nut nutrition, which I'll give you a quick sample. Uh, leaves, we looked at leaf litter decomposition as well as insect feeding, both aquatic and terrestrial. No differences between the, American, or the wild type and the transgenic. We even fed these things to wood tadpoles and um, really no difference in, in most of the things that we looked at, but there was the one difference that's kind of interesting here, not between the genetic engineered and the, and the non-genetic engineered, but looking at chestnut compared to other trees that will be found in the forest along with chestnut, such as sugar maple, American beech. And we also looked at the hybrid chestnut and Chinese chestnut. This is uh, showing the uh, non-supplemented growth um, and development of the wood, wood frog tadpoles. And they actually did better on the American chestnut, kind of indication that these trees will actually benefit the environment, whether they're wild type or genetically engineered. So I just wanted to kind of point out some of these experiments we did. This is with the bumblebees where we use micro colonies. And this is, we use different concentrations of the um, oxo enzyme that we added directly to a pollen so we could actually measure it directly. Uh, we took a concentration that was very similar to what we expect to be in the pollen. And then we took a concentration that was 10 times higher than what we'd expect to be in the pollen. And we tracked survival, pollen use, hive construction and reproduction. And these are just some sample results. These are um, survivability, looking at um, just the pollen by itself in red the standard uh, concentration of OXO, and then the tenfold high concentration. And it looks at the mortality over time. And what you see is really there's no significant differences there. And even at the very end time, it turns out the highest concentration had the most bees left and the ones with no oxalate oxidase had the least bees, but they were not significantly different. We also looked at pollen use per day. And again, no significant differences there. Uh, at the end, um, 
the actual ones that use the most pollen uh, were the standard concentrations, uh, but again, not significantly different. So these are not gonna affect bees. We did a lot of different uh, nutrient profiles on the nuts. Uh, this is just one of them as a sample. Uh, this is a fatty acid profile. Um, for example, uh, one of the important fatty acids are the monosaturated uh, fatty acids in nuts. And if you look at that um, between the uh, transgenic and the non-transgenic and all the other ones we tested, there's really not a significant difference. The only ones that stand out is the one in yellow, which is the European chestnut, which is different than the American chestnuts. And the one purple one, which is an American chestnut, was a bit lower. We almost think that that might be, have some of the European genes in it. But if you look at all these, the green is the transgenic, the blue is the uh, sibling of that transgenic without the oxide oxidase. Again, no big differences. So our tree will probably be one of the most tested trees or most studied trees ever <laughs> because we have to go through this regulatory process. Right now we're in the middle of the USDA uh, review. They review for safety, for agriculture and the environment, mainly focusing on plant pest risk and potential weediness. Um, they actually write an environmental impact statement. They're doing that right now. Um, and the EPA will review that. And we go through a number of open comment periods and notifications to indigenous groups and other stakeholders. Um, and the goal is to grant non-regulated status. Then we will go through the FDA. Um, this is gonna be probably much shorter. The USDA is a, a fairly large document. The FDA would be much shorter because they're only interested in the nuts and nutritional uh, allergens and toxins, uh, which there are not any um, from this oxalate oxidase. Uh, then we go into the EPA, which is a really tough process. We're going through that right now, trying to get our documents together. We're up to like 2,800 and some pages um, and they all to be cross-linked and you know, from references and everything, a very big, um, big task. Then finally, we'll go to the Canadian regulators, the CFIA, because American chestnut goes into the chestnut range up into Canada. So with this regulatory process, this is where we can get, need your help. Um, we go through these open comment periods and we need people to write in and support the work that we are doing. Um, you can read all the documentation that we submitted and um, you, know, you can write something short, something long, but we need all the help we can get to get these things through the process. Now, as we go through that, we're not just sitting still. We are actually doing a lot of breeding with the trees. And the nice thing about using genetic engineering again is that we're putting in what's considered pretty much a dominant gene. If you have the oxide oxidase, you can survive the blight. So this allows us to actually go out and rescue that genetic diversity that are surviving in the millions of stump sprouts in, in the forest. So we can actually go out and outcross to those trees and start building up diversity in, in a restoration population. You do that by taking your transgenic tree, you outcross to what we call mother trees, you take the seed from those mother trees, uh, we can test that. And again, about half of the offspring will have the uh, gene. We have a really nice little assay that gives you the start coloration up there. Uh, we can do it with leaves or we can actually do it with nut cores. We will take them and then uh, these will represent different combinations of genetic alleles from the two parents. So you're building up diversity. You keep outcrossing them. Um, one to three generations we figure would be have enough diversity for a horticultural release and three to five generations for starting uh, forest restoration. We're already through the third generation. We just planted it today or yesterday the, uh, some of our T3 generation uh, trees. And we're also looking at making sure we capture the local adaptations, whether it's from the south or from the north um, and such as that. We also wanna get um, citizen scientists involved. So we have to wait till the regulatory process is over, but we're already starting to train citizen scientists. Uh, one of the things that we would like to do is have them actually go out and find surviving chestnut trees and we would send them pollen um, so that they can do crosses on their own. Uh, we've had uh, pollination workshops on campus. Last year we couldn't, so we made a virtual pollination workshop. If anybody was interested in watching it, it's on YouTube at this uh, address. 
And basically it describes our project and how you can actually do crosses on American chestnut. This year, we're actually gonna do something a little bit different uh, as we come out of the pandemic. We're gonna actually send out kits, uh, at least to the New York uh, chapter uh, people. So we're gonna start, start small and work our way up um, where we're gonna send kits that can allow people to practice pollination of, of chestnut trees. We'll send out pollen that's non-transgenic but it has everything that you need to, to try to do a cross. And hopefully that will give them the confidence and the know-how. So when our transgenic pollen is available, they can do crosses with it. Now I'm getting near the end, but um, I wanna mention something that's really important about genetic engineering. That's not the same for other methods of tree improvement. And that is that with the genetically engineered tree, um, even after a hundred years, let's say you had a tree such as this one here, uh, you could still get non-transgenic or wild type uh, American chestnut seed from this tree, uh, you know, centuries down the road. As long as that tree is alive, it can produce the non-transgenic. And so why is that important? Well, is that you can always get back the original tree and maybe you have some better method to uh, try to restore the tree sometime in the future. Well, you can get back that original tree and then work on that. That is not true for any of the other breeding methods. Okay, so how does restoration go? Well, one of the things that we don't wanna do is um, plant, you know, cut down trees to plant trees, uh, but there are plenty of places where we can plant these trees, uh, for, such as mine reclamation. We're working with the American Chestnut Foundation on that. Um, but this is gonna be a long process. We call it a century long uh, restoration project. Um, these trees are not weeds. They do not travel very far on their own. Uh, only one or two miles per hundred years. That's a hundred years, yes. Uh, so they just, they can spread, but it's like extremely slow. Uh, so it's really gonna rely on people planting these to really get uh, significant numbers out, okay? We also hope that as we get this tree out, we can start you know, convincing people that this is a good model system for restoring other trees. Our forests are, are um, being threatened by many exotic uh, invasive pathogens and pests, uh, such as a list here. This is a picture of uh, sudden oak death on Tan Oak in California. And even though genetic engineering is not a magic bullet, it won't work all the time. It is one of the tools in the toolbox that we should have available so we can do everything we can to uh, save our forests. Now, sometimes people ask, you know, what about unintended consequences. Well, we actually have one here that kind of, uh, it's actually an unexpected benefit um, that we didn't, didn't know until about a year or two ago. Um, uh, some researchers from the University of Florida contacted us and asked us, you know, well, could, could this uh, new tree be a source for the enzyme oxide oxidase and for use in medical uh, purposes? And they started, so we said, well, um, if you want to look at it, go ahead, we'll send you the leaves. And they did. Um, so they were extracting uh, oxide oxidases from um, barley seedling roots and they got about one unit of enzyme per 100 grams. But from our chestnut trees, they were getting about 10 units per 100 grams. So that's about a tenfold increase by using our trees. And um, they were actually before trying to do genetic engineering of rice to make these uh, oxide oxidase enzymes. And this is quote, our transgenic rice doesn't even come close to your chestnuts. And so this would be a really cheap source. I mean, it's just leaves, you know, the tree leaves, loses leaves every year anyway. Um, so you could just harvest a, a number of leaves and get this enzyme. And um, what they were looking at is for using in some of the test kits. And they said here that with uh, some extra processing, so right there was working with crude extracts right now, you can get, um, uh, matching the, the best on the market right now. So this is kind of going back to what I said earlier is that chestnut was at one time a uh, medicinal plant and you might have new medicinal properties for it. In fact, there are researchers out there, not with us, but researchers who are looking at oxid oxidases for treatment of certain conditions such as hypo you see, hyper oxaluria. See if I can pronounce that right. But anyway, so that's a condition that often results in kidney stones. But that's not our main purpose. Again, we want to bring the trees back, as I said before, um, for wood products, uh, those medical uses as mentioned, but agriculture, 
It's also, you know, kind of re restoring our history and of course our forests and the benefits it gives there. So do you think American chestnut is important? Hopefully your answer is yes, it is very important. And what I'm gonna do is ask you to help spread this word, you know, to your friends, family, on social media, your political representatives, whoever you can talk to, let them know about the, the story of the chestnut and that it can be returned. Um, and also during the regulatory process, uh, respond to the regulators. That is always very helpful. For those who wanna go a little bit further, you can always join the American Chestnut Foundation. This is their website. And um, we work very closely with them. They're actually gonna be um, our major help of actually distributing these trees in the future, because we're just a university. We don't have um, all the facilities to make a lot of trees. So they're gonna help us out a lot. If you wanna support our research directly, um, this is our uh, website um, where we describe our project and you can go there. Okay, this work is never done in isolation. These are our current uh, team members, uh, staff and graduate students, undergraduates. Um, we even have um, high school students working during the summer on the project. So this year we're having 30 people uh, helping us out. Um, over the years, it's been literally hundreds of people who've worked on this project. So I wanna stop here with this quote. This is a quote, quote by uh, one of our faculty members in my department, Dr. Robin Kimmerer. She had the opportunity to talk at the UN a few years ago. And I just really like this quote from that uh, speech. It says, we humans are more than consumers. We have gifts of our own to give to the earth. And that's the way I view this chestnut project. We're actually giving something back. Um, it's a problem caused by humans by bringing these uh, pathogens around the world to the United States. And I think it's up to us to solve that problem. So I wanna thank you at this point and uh, take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Bill. I personally wanna, wanna commend you and, and point out the rather extensive work you've done to prove that the changes you made in the plant are not harmful, not only to the plant, but to things that feed on the plant or are affected by the plant. So I'll start off with a, with a couple of questions here. Uh, if, I think the answer, you covered this, but I'll ask anyway. Have you noticed any off-target effects of um, the oxalate oxidase increase or, or the PGIPs? Okay, so the PGIPs are, are new. We haven't got whole plants for that yet. We're still looking at those genes, but the oxalate oxidase we've gone quite far with, and that's when we're going through the regulatory process. So we're not really seeing any off-target effects what we are seeing, um, you know, is pretty much this, exactly the same. There is, uh, on some genetic backgrounds, uh, a little bit of a slower growth uh, with the oxidase, oxidase being expressed all the time, and so we are actually countering that because we have another set of uh, trees coming through the pipeline that have um, a what's called a wind promoter, a wound inducible promoter. So that it's not on all the time. It only gets uh, expressed during wounding or pathogen attack. Um, so we actually have those coming through. But even, even the ones that are expressed all the time, there are some that just grow normally too. And I think it, we're, that's one of our things that we're trying to look at in a common garden experiment is saying, is there certain genotypes that are more compatible with the oxalate oxidase than others? I have a question from, from molecular biologist, Carl Merrill. Carl? Thank you. Um, I've been interested in agrobacteria tumor facients for years because I worked in genetic engineering and um, I, I'm sure most people know that you can see tumors on plants throughout most of North America due to the agrobacter tumor facients, which as you pointed out is fairly natural. Um, the, the question I have has to do with uh, the FDA role in this because I thought that most foods were grandfathered in. I mean, we know that there are certain foods like corn. If people just eat exclusively corn, then they end up with pellagra because it doesn't have enough niacin. And that's a problem throughout the whole world. So there are certain plants and, and foods that we eat that uh, ha cause problems if people aren't aware of that. And, and I thought that the, the FDA, that was not in their domain. So I'm a little curious. I mean, we don't study all the other nuts, the walnut and everything else to see if they have deleterious effects. So I, I don't know how they can compare 
this with anything else. I, I just wanted your comments on that. Yeah, so it all has to do because we're it has to do with the technique we're using. Okay, so we're using genetic engineering, and unfortunately, genetic engineering uh, is more highly regulated than anything else. And um, so, with the FDA, because we use genetic engineering, we we're going through that process. It, it's kind of a weird thing. So they are doing what's called a consulting uh, for our our plants. So it's not actually required, but if you don't go through it and something happens, you're in big trouble. So everybody goes through the FDA consults and consulting. But, but it's sort of strange because corn was developed by genetic engineering by ancestors years ago through selective breeding. In fact, that's true probably for most of our foods. So, I mean, it's a fine line between selective breeding and, 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 and doing what you're doing. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And, and I think we need a system more like the Canadian system where they look at the trait and they regulate it according to the trait, not by the method. But the United States, they're, they're, they're trying to move in a certain direction to try to get away from the, the uh, method thing, but they're still there. And what triggers the regulation is the method, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, we have a, a question from uh, Tim Thomas, who kindly sponsored this lecture. What tree replaced the chestnut in the canopy? I'm thinking the tulip tree, but what do you think? And did so, the loss of the chestnut impact the process that drove the passenger pigeon extinct? Okay, so two questions there. What, what replaced the chestnut is probably lots of different species, uh, but probably mainly the oaks and um, like, you know, red oaks and white oaks and stuff, um, because they used to grow along with the chestnut. So they, were, they grew in the same types of areas. Uh, so did they get it? Co yeah, did it help with the passenger pigeon? It, it, it's close, <laughs> but the times of the blight and the loss of passenger pigeon don't exactly match. The passenger pigeon was already going out and maybe the blight helped, you know, uh, at, at the final end of that. But uh, so I've, I've seen papers where they kind of uh, associated those two things together, but I don't think it's really been proven. Thank you. I think we'll take a question from the web and then we'll go to Kristen Ferry. Um, question from YouTube. Jorge Aponte asks, I think this is a good question to follow up on the one we just had. How does the public accept the idea of transgenic seeds? Is there difficulty explaining this to the public? Do people generally accept the idea of a genetically modified chestnut tree? And I'll add something. And how has that changed or uh, how has that uh, motivated the behavior of the FDA? Okay. So um, we always have our dis distractors, um, but for chestnut, it's kind of interesting because uh, it's changed a lot of people's minds in, um, compared to other types of, of uh, genetically engineered crops. But uh, we have very high support for our work. People have done studies and what they found is that if there's some uh, benefit to the general public, they tend to be more accepting of genetic engineering, and they see that you know this is this is a good cause. Uh, we, we've actually um, done certain things to make sure that we don't aggravate the anti-GMO people. We we have not patented our trees, and we're not going to patent them. Um, we were very careful picking the genes, in that you know we try to pick genes that are very um, benign you know, and, and to, to almost to the point of, you know, we probably could have picked genes that would give us even higher levels of resistance, but we didn't want to, want to, um, you know, aggravate the, the problem. So we got, you know, actually very high support. We went through the uh, open comment period uh, with USDA back in uh, August, September, and we had like, I'm trying to remember the numbers, like 63% in favor and like 34% against us or something like that. And then the others neutral, um, which is actually probably better than any other GE crop that went through that, that process. Uh, so we have a lot of support and, and the support are from people just, you know, who 
who want to plant these trees. You know, the people who are against it are actually mostly people who are not even living in the range where these trees will be planted. So it's, just, it's kind of interesting. Oh, what was the second part of that question again? I wanted to know how the perception of public attitudes has motivated the regulatory authorities to be more stringent right. with G GMOs than they, than they are with, what right. I like to say is, is the more, the less precise methods of, of right. introducing mutation. So um, in theory, the, the, the public opinion should have no impact on the regulators. They regulate according to the science. Um, and so they're looking for, you know, like during the open comment period, scientific comments of, you know, support or against, you know, what are we missing type comments. So they shouldn't uh, be influenced at all. That doesn't mean they're not human and, and <laughs> do get uh, slightly influenced by that. Um, but that hasn't stopped them from deregulating uh, other genetically engineered uh, crops. So I don't think that's going to be a problem for chestnut. But it's not going to be a problem because actually we have much more support, you know, almost double the support than the people who are against us. Yeah, I think I introduced that kind of question, but I was really more generally aiming at the overall uh, focus on, on GMOs in a way that is not applied to other uh, ways of introducing mutations in order to improve crop varieties, yeah. and I think <clears throat> I think clearly they were scared off by the anti-GMO movement to take a, a much more focused look at it. Yeah, because and, otherwise and it doesn't make sense, right? You it it, it, does, it doesn't make sense because they, they don't know what they're doing at all except uh, phenotypic selection. You know, right? Exactly what you're doing at the genetic level. Yeah, I mean, if you compare it to hybridization between species, it, it, you know, there's no comparison. Genetic engineering is so much, has so much less risk to it. And, and hybridization really doesn't have high risk, but genetic engineering has less. So yeah, so I guess it is public opinion that kind of made this more regulated than it really needs to be. So I have a question from a PSW member, Kristen Ferry. Kristen? I uh, can we uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so I'm a, an engineer, but also a farmer. I uh, have a farm about 100 miles southwest of Washington, and I mention it uh, for a couple reasons. One, I want to be part of this, but the other thing, an observation. Uh, my family got this farm in 1965, and over the past 56 years, I've seen the ecosystem changing. And I only recently began to understand that the arc I'm seeing is part of the uh, ecosystem trying to adapt to the die off of the chestnut trees. And the evidence of how many of them were on the farm is that everything on the farm was built of chestnut, fences, mm -hmm. barns, ev house, everything because of the die off in that time frame. the, the uh, first part of the 20th century. Um, but my question is, how do I prepare to participate in uh, bringing the chestnut back? Uh, I mean, are there uh, things I can do uh, uh, in terms of the logging I might do anyway, how I might approach it? Uh, uh, are there soil types, uh, sun, slope? Can you make some general comments on how someone might prepare for the for these trees yeah and and site selection actually is very important you, you mentioned that at the end and there's actually a um, called a chestnut chat today on site selection for chestnut chestnuts like um more acidic soils they can go anywhere from 4.5 to 6.5 and with 5.5 being about the the optimum uh, they can grow at higher than 6.5 but you usually get stunted growth you sometimes get necrotic leaves um, so you want to kind of go with the more acidic soils in the, in the talk today, they just mentioned too, that if you happen to have a more neutral soil, let's say 7.0, the way you can get by that is plant a chestnut with a white, uh, white pine and the white pine mm -hmm. will provide, uh, the pH control for the chestnut. It's kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, getting the right soil, you want something that's, um, well-drained. You don't want a place where water stands. 
because chestnuts don't like their feet wet, so to speak. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, other than that, they don't need a lot of fertilizer and they can actually grow in some pretty tough places. They love rocky areas. You know, um, sometimes people plant them in the, these rocky areas with almost no soil and the roots will find its way around and, and they do well in those. Um, so yeah, a good site selection is important. Uh, far as, you know, getting ready, um, you can always uh, contact me. We have a list uh, where, of people that w- who want to know when the trees get through the regulatory process and become available. And uh, once, you know, they become available, we will send out an email to everybody on that list. Uh, we also use that list for the open comment periods too. We ask people to send in comments during a time. So if you get on that list, you'll be notified. Um, in the meantime, the best thing you can do actually is get some wild type trees. You can get them from our, our New York chapter for free, or you can buy them from the national, uh, either way, uh, and do some practice growing. You, uh, you can grow trees actually for a number of years before they get the blight and uh, just you know practice, see how they do. And, and you can test out sites on your property um, for that. Uh, you know, if you're already cutting down trees, you could you can plant these uh, when they become available in those places. Uh, or, you know, we're actually testing out what's called shelterwood plantings, where you can plant them under a canopy. You have to open up the canopy enough to let some light down, but um, they will sit underneath that canopy. They're partially shade tolerant, and they'll develop a good root system, grow. And then if a tree falls down nearby that opens up the canopy, they will shoot up. And, and outpace anything around them uh, and fill that gap. Uh, so yeah, you can do a lot of different things to kind of prepare. Uh, well, you've just described why we had so many chestnut trees. One of the fascinating, I mean, we got the rocky acidic soil. Uh, one of the fascinating things that I didn't understand uh, from until I heard your talk here was the effect on the water uh, and the, uh, the, what's going on in the creeks because I've seen changes there. Uh, and I think I finally understand that based on what you said tonight. Uh, thank you so much for your dedication and this talk. Thank you. Here, here. Uh, we have a question from another PSW member, Al Ehrlich. Al, can you turn your microphone on? Thank you very much, Larry. I have two questions, if you would, please. The first is, how long does the living root system below the dead stump stay alive, providing you with that potential diversity that, that would be so nice to have? Yeah, that's a good question. And, um, you know, I vis- visit places where there are still surviving chestnuts, like a uh, Mohonk Mountain in, in New York. Um, and what they've said is that, you know, these, these keep re-sprouting, they get killed back down to the ground over and over again. But then as the canopy of the other trees kind of start closing in, um, they, they don't grow as much and, and eventually the stumps do die. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually looked into how many cycles it can go through. It probably depends on you know, how quick or how big they get before the next cycle of death comes. Uh, you know, how much energy can they store in the roots? Um, and, and So they can, they can put up an, enough tree and leaves with each cycle to more or less sustain themselves as long as they have an open space in the canopy. It, it seems that way. Yes. You, you know, if, if everything's going right, they can just keep going that way. They're, but they're not propagating. They're not, you know, producing offspring. They're just, you know, surviving. Right. And, and thank you very much. And I do have the second question. In that situation where you had that aerial picture with a lone flowering tree, and you needed another tree of opposite gender, I guess, within a hundred feet. Um, humans do hand pollination of things. I, I wondered why some pollen couldn't be harvested from one tree and then humans do the traveling, find another compatible tree and fertilize. Yeah, that, that's a great thought because um, people have actually been doing that. The uh, New York chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation has been doing that since I first came to ESF. Uh, they find these trees, they've done hand pollinations, and then they take the offspring and put into what they call conservation orchards. Oh, and, great. Um, try to maintain those as long as they can. You know, the trees come and go in those orchards because of the blight. 
But uh, yeah, people are doing that. Um, again, the New York chapter has a, a nut exchange at their meeting every year where people bring in the nuts and they, they pass them around so they can get diversity um, in their plantings. Um, but uh, yeah, so that is going on. And, and the national is doing that too, all over the range. Um, and if, if you want to do that, you can do that. And, and you can watch our uh, pollination workshop on the web and, and learn how to do crosses. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for your answers and for the talk. You're welcome. So we just have a few more questions. One is uh, how, how are you supported? Okay, that, that's a good question. Cause um, you know, when we first started we had really struggled to be uh, find support but once we started making progress and, and showing that we can enhance resistance, um, the support really gained. Uh, so our support right now, our major donor is um, the uh, Templeton World Charity Fund. Uh, so we have a very large grant from them and their grant is, is called the Kickoff to Restoration. So we're trying to finish up the regulatory process with that, as well as make trees that we can um, distribute as well as doing demonstration plantings that people can learn from for restoration. We also get funding from the American Chestnut Foundation every year. Uh, we've gotten that for about six years now uh, from the national and actually from the state chapter, we've gotten that from the beginning back since uh, 1990. Um, we also have had uh, grants from the USDA. Uh, we just are finishing up a USDA BRAG grant, which is a biotechnology risk ass assessment grant that's ending this year. Um, so that was good support. And we get a lot of support from donations, uh, from just the people who want to support us. We have a, uh, um, a site on our, our website that you can, you can donate directly. Uh, and there's all sizes of donations, small to large. And um, that's been very helpful. In fact, that, that's helped us recently buy a bigger tractor <laughs> to uh, help us uh, you know, prepare our fields because all of a sudden our, our fields have grown immensely and uh, we need to have the um, equipment to keep, keep them going. Um, so, so lots of different places. We used to get uh, money from the state of New York. Uh, um, we used to get about 100,000 a year from them until uh, COVID. It was interesting. So we, we got funding from them for like three or four years. And then we had 9-11 and that cut off. And then we had just recently three or four years of uh, funding from the state and then COVID hit and that got cut off. So, so anytime there's a, a big disaster, uh, we didn't tend to lose our state funding. <laughs> Do you have FTEs from the state for, through the college? Have, I'll say that again, please. I have FTEs from the, from the college. I, I'm staff, not sure what FTEs. Staff FT members who are paid for as faculty through the college. Um, well. Would you have to split your time? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's normal splitting time. I, I teach classes and stuff and I advise students. I do the normal things that faculty will do. Um, I just recently, because I got the big grant, I was able to drop one of my classes or I actually bought it out so someone else is teaching it. <laughs> but um, otherwise, yeah, we, we have to do all the normal things a faculty member does. And the facilities are owned by? Facilities are owned by the college. Uh, and um, we do rent one lab uh, called the um, Biotechnology Accelerator uh, uh, building. And um, so we'd pay, pay rent on that one, but all the other facilities are owned by the college and, and supported by the college. So I'll just ask you, uh, did you try amplifying the genes that are um, provide some resistance that are endogenous? So actually all the genes that we're trying to get from the Chinese chestnut are also present in the American chestnut. And so most of them are just expressed at different levels. They might have different amino acid sequences too, but like, for example, that lactase gene, they're exactly the same in the two and just have different uh, sequences in the promoter and get different levels of expression. So we are doing that. Now you, we can take genes from uh, those species, but none of those genes are gonna give us full resistance. You know, they're gonna help booster or, you know, the support the resistance we're getting from the oxide oxidase. The oxide oxidase is the only thing that really, you know, shot us up to really high levels of resistance. Okay, so two, just two last questions. Do you know anybody's working on phylloxera and in, in grapevines? 
Well, um, Grapevines, yeah, Cornell, uh, they do a lot of great research. Uh, and um, I'm, I can't think of the names of the people right now, because actually some of the people I work with before, I think are retired. Uh, but I think they're still doing great research in Cornell. Yeah, they do a lot of Davis too, but I didn't know if anybody was trying to genetically engineer vinifera varieties that don't require grafting onto Lambrusca rootstocks. And, well, they were doing genetic engineering with it. I don't know if anything ever went through the regulatory process. They have a challenge in that, you know, if they're going to sell wine, you know, convincing people that it's okay to genetically engineer um, wine to drink, which it should be okay. Um, but um, I know they've done genetic engineering, but I don't know if anything's actually reached the market in, in the grapes. Last question is, uh, do you know of anybody who's working on uh, isolating the medicinally effective compounds from, from chestnut based on the traditional? Um, yeah, so there is, there's a group in Europe who, who's doing that and I have their papers and stuff. I haven't actually met them, um, but I've read their papers. And so they, they were looking at extracts and see how they uh, affect uh, staph uh, bacteria and uh, it's kind of an inter it's interesting work because, you know, they're showing that there's an effect there. So those people back in the olden days, <laughs> so to speak, who were just making teas and stuff like that out of these, actually were, were doing something with that, you know. The, yeah, there's, there's often truth in the yeah. original remedies, not always, but, but oftentimes. Yeah. And there are lots of stories of people um, following up on a traditional remedy and, and getting a compound that's bioactive in yeah. pure form. Anyway, I really am thrilled that you could come and give us this talk and I'm even more excited about the work that you've done. And I hope in my lifetime to see stands of chestnut trees and, and to live near a spreading chestnut tree. Yes. Are really gorgeous, gorgeous specimen. So thank you so much for this. And as you know, you have a rain check to join us on us mm -hmm. when you're in DC for any PSW event that happens to coincide with your schedule or mm -hmm. if not that, then please tell us in advance and we'll arrange something. Oh, well, that's great. Thank Very you. Have a nice evening at the Cosmos Club together. Thanks. Thank you so much. And, and we thanks everybody for listening. To website to support you. Okay, <laughs> thanks. We have some, a few closing announcements. The next meeting, the 2,442nd, will be on Friday, June 4th, and will feature the 90th annual Joseph Henry Lecture. The speaker will be Carlo Ravelli, director of the Quantum Gravity Group at the Center for Theoretical Physics in Marseille, France, and distinguished in visiting research chair at the Perimeter Institute. He will be speaking on quantum gravity and theories like loop quantum gravity that seek to unify general relativity with quantum mechanics one of the last great challenges in theoretical physics. The 2,443rd meeting, Caps Stoning the Spring Series, will be on June 18th. The speaker will be Steve Stitch, program manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program. He will be speaking on the US Commercial Crew Program and human spaceflight. Any changes to the spring lecture series, should there be any, and lectures coming this fall will be posted to the PSW website. Check there often for updates. And please join me in thanking tonight's crew, James, Anne, and Robin in the background, who's our director and keeps the YouTube and Zoom streams working the way they're supposed to. And with that, I will now adjourn the 2,441st meeting of the society to everybody's personal social hour. The meeting is adjourned.